morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. As we prepare our hearts to hear from the reading and preaching of God's holy word, let us pray. Sovereign Father, we praise you. We thank you that you are not only the creator who sustains, you are not only the Lord of all, you are not only the saviour of the world, but we can also call you Father. In Jesus, we can just approach you as your children, not only with the benefits of this relationship with you, but with a mission, a mission to proclaim, a mission to bear witness to all that you are, not only in your church, but in this world that you love. So we pray, O oh God, that as we delve deep into your word, that your Holy Spirit will open our eyes to see the truths of your word, to draw us close to you, to enable us to see and to be convicted of who you are, who we are, and what you have called us to do in this world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. We continue this morning on our reflections on the Psalms. And this morning, we will be looking specifically at Psalm 33. So if you have your Bibles with you, you could keep that open as we go through the various parts of this psalm. I would like to begin by asking all of us a very simple question. Uh, when was the last time you cheered for something? Could you, could you remember that? I know it's early in the morning, but could you remember an occasion in your life where there was uh, a natural, perhaps even sudden outburst of joy? Could it be when you were taking part in a sporting event? Uh, could it be as part of some group dynamics at work? You achieved your mission, you won the competition. Which one would it be? Is there a place for such cheering, shouts of joy, even in the church? I would like to humbly submit that there should be. And there is already, actually, when we look at how we sing the hymns, for example, the exclamations of praise and appreciation for who God is. Uh, at the top of my mind, I can think of one very simple chorus that actually has a crescendo, actually, with that expression, just with that phrase or that word, hallelujah. Um, this may be familiar to, to most of us. It sounds a bit like this. It starts this way. It starts um, with... Hallelujah, 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 praise ye the Lord. And it starts in quietly. Hallelujah, 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 praise ye the Lord. That is a very simple example of a hymn that encourages the body of Christ to exclaim who God is with that phrase, isn't it? Of course, when we say hallelujah, uh, of course, some of our friends will say, what is that? You know, it doesn't sound English. What does it mean? And for all of us who, who know the Bible, we know that that phrase is basically three words, actually. Praise ye the Lord. No, four words. So the word halal means to praise. With the word u, it is actually in the form of an imperative. A bit of Hebrew this morning. Yeah? Imperative meaning is in the tone of a command. It means we have to tell each other, hey, you, praise God. And yah is the short form for the name of God himself, sometimes pronounced as Yahweh. So why do we praise God? Last week, in our reflection on Psalm 23, uh, I mentioned that we shouldn't praise God out of duress, out of guilt, or just because your pastor says you've got to do it. As I mentioned earlier, when we exclaim shouts of joy, even to God, it is out of this deep sense of appreciation, this sense of gratefulness for who He is. And who is this God that we worship this morning? Revealed as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What does Psalm 33 tell us about why we worship this God with such outbursts of joy and exclamation? Let's delve into God's Word again this morning. Psalm 33 begins this way, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The psalmist begins by calling the congregation of Israel to worship. He says, shout for joy in the Lord. Now, sometimes we associate shouting in not so pleasant circumstances. Sometimes we hear it in the streets or in the public space. We wonder, oh, what's that causing that commotion? 
But here it's used in the positive sense. It is a shout, an exclamation for joy in the Lord. And the psalmist says, shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous, praise befits the upright. This is a statement that doesn't only hearken the people of God to worship, but it hearkens the people of God to worship in light of who they are. The psalmist here says, praise befits the upright. Praise the Lord, shout for joy, O you righteous. Now it's important that we first and foremost understand that when the psalmist addresses the people of God as those who are upright, as those who are righteous, it is not because of something that is in them to begin with. As good Christians, we all know, isn't it? Ultimately, in Jesus Christ, our righteousness is not from within, but stems only from Him. And so, even for the people of God, back in the Old Testament, they recognized that similarly, when they are called righteous, it is in relation to who Yahweh is. It is in relation to what Yahweh requires Israel to do as people who live out His precepts, who live out His principles in the kingdom of God, even in the ancient Near East. He says, in light of this righteous God, who has done great things for you and whom we will see later, is described in three primary, primary contexts. He says, this God who is righteous requires you to live a life of righteousness. He calls us, therefore, in light of who God is, He addresses the people of God and even us today as righteous, as upright. Not perfect, but people who are committed to the righteous way of God. And we will see very soon that righteousness is not just a private sense of virtues, a personal way of life. No, no. The righteousness of God is pervasive throughout the earth, in creation, in nations, in peoples. And it is in that context that he says to the people of God, and even to us, his church today, that our praise reflects the righteousness of God as his righteous people. How are we to do that? How are we to reflect that righteousness? Let's carry on. The psalmist says in verse 2, Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to Him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. So I I don't think the psalmist is just telling us to be noisy. eh? Let's not misunderstand the psalmist. I am actually by nature a very quiet and private person. I need my space, you know. And so when I have three boys, two, two of them, eight and six, and one is a 12-week-old 12, uh, 12 crying baby, I really need my space even more. So I'm not the type of person who will just tell people to be noisy. In fact, I crave peace and quiet. But there is also a place for intentional exclamations Not because you have to do it as a Christian, but because as you reflect, as the Holy Spirit convicts your heart for how great a God we serve, even this morning. We cannot help but burst out with exclamation. We cannot but burst out with beautiful compositions of music. We cannot help but sing new songs. And I'll reflect on that later. What do we mean when the psalmist says we have to sing new songs? Does that mean every Sunday has to be a brand new hymn? Uh, No, of course not. But what this psalmist is alluding to here is the inevitable outbursts of appreciation when one finally reckons with the beauty of God's greatness. I remember speaking to a professor of New Testament uh, almost 10 years ago now. We were reflecting on how true discipleship uh, should be expressed you know, could it be in, in, the, in your articulation of the doctrines, your faithfulness to the interpretation of Scripture? And we finally landed on this particular but inevitable expression. He told me this. He said, do you know, Paul, when one really understands, not just here, but really understands what the Lord has done for you in Jesus, you cannot but burst out in song. This is a professor of New Testament historian of the Malaysian church himself. Uh, I won't tell you his name. He has even preached in this church before. He said, you cannot but burst out in song when you truly understand 
So perhaps you need not shout and scare people next to you. But when was the last time perhaps then you just could not help but hum a tune or sing a song as you were walking or jogging, you say, praise the Lord, you know. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. And sing it out. When was the last time we did that? Well, we did it this morning. Praise God, isn't it? We're doing it this morning itself. And we're not just doing it alone, we're doing it together. And so there should be a sense of willingness and not just religious obligation. One that is inevitable as we reflect, as the Holy Spirit makes us see how great a God we worship. But the psalmist also says in verse 3, isn't it? Sing to him a new song. What does he mean by that? Now, what it does not mean is that every day you need to come up with a new composition. Every day needs to be an original masterpiece. No, no, no. What the psalmist is trying to say to the people of Israel is that as you encounter God daily, you need to respond accordingly. That's what it means to sing a new song, you know? That means to come up with a fresh original expression in response to God's revelation to you, in response to God's blessing in your life, in response to God's nurturing of your heart in the way of Jesus. So I hope we, we understand exegetically that when he says sing a new song, it doesn't mean that we have to do away with all the songs every month or every year. No, no, no. It means that we are to theologize. Every one of us is actually a composer, not necessarily in a musical sense, but we are a composer of what we believe about God. We need to put into our own words, our own hearts, a response in whichever way. It doesn't have to be in song necessarily. It could be just in prayer. Your own words to tell God how you feel. To tell God how you are grateful for what He has done in your family's life. To God for all the things. And nothing is too small. Nothing is too small. In the midst of talking about God as being such a great God, let's not forget that He's also God of the small things. Some people have scoffed when we talk about testimonies, for example, like praying for parking space in KL. People say, come on, man, we've got to pray for more, you know, bigger things. But I don't think so. If you look at the Psalms, there is no space where God isn't Lord. Let me say that. When we look at the Psalms, there is no space where God isn't Lord. Every space is His domain, even the car park space. So it's not trivial. Please don't, don't misunderstand. It's not trivial at all. But those are expressions of your worship of God. It may not be in a melody. Some, I know, Christians who are so devoted to God find the most intimate encounters with God in worship in nature. Uh, go for morning hikes and apart from getting a good cardio workout, you look around Look at all the different species, all the different organisms. You look at the ecosystem, how it is sustained. We need to pause and say, yes, this is the God of the Bible that's mentioned in Psalms. And we will read about it. We have read about it just now. So this is what the psalmist means when he says, sing to him a new song. Of course, it's good if you're, prof if you're gifted in music. Yeah, I use it. Some people are good in poetry, write poetry. Some people are good in painting. Some people are good in hiking. Do it. But the point here is to rejoice in what God has done. Yes, ultimately in Jesus Christ, in calling us His children in Christ. But it's not at the expense of what He's doing as Creator, as Lord of the nations as well. And we will see this very soon. Now, why does the psalmist say do this? Why does the psalmist say, shout for joy, appreciate him, sing a new song? Well, it says here in verse 4, For the word of the Lord is upright. All his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. And he expounds further. He says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap, he puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The first reason why we see the psalmist calling the people of God to worship, to praise Yahweh is because, number one, God is 
a God of righteousness and faithfulness on the earth. We must never forget that. That God's righteousness and God's justice is on the earth. He says that in verse 4 and 5, isn't it? He says, the word of the Lord is upright. All his work is done in faithfulness. All his work where? What is the context of his work? Not just in the heavenly realm, but he goes on to say, he loves righteousness and justice and the earth, our earth, all creation, is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Remember this phrase, uh, uh, in the NIV, is uh, translated as unfailing love. It comes from the same Hebrew word, chesed, which means God's unfailing love, God's steadfast love. And this is a very important phrase because this is mentioned uh, at least 266 times throughout the Old Testament, and of which half of it, by the way, is featured here in the Psalms. The Psalms cannot help but always harken back to God's unfailing love. What is this unfailing love? Well, it is a commitment by God. But as we see here, it is not only a commitment by God to Israel, it is a commitment by God to the earth. Do we see that? It's there in verse 4 and 5. The word of the Lord is upright. All his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. We have to be cognizant about the vastness of God's love. It is specific, yes, specifically communicated to Israel, but for the whole world. Let's not forget that. Let's not even be exclusive about it. Yahweh is not only the God of Israel. Yahweh is not only the God of the church. The same Yahweh, the same God who revealed His Son Jesus Christ for the salvation of the world. As I said earlier, there is no space where God is not Lord. And it's in light of this that the psalmist says to the people of God here, the first part, he talks about how by this word of God, all creation exists. It says in verse 6, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, by the breath of His mouth, all their hosts, He gathers the waters of the sea as if He puts the deep in storehouses. Let the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe. For He spoke, came to be, He commanded and He stood firm. This is the first aspect of the God in whom the psalmist calls the people of God to worship. That He is the Creator who sustains. We've been living here on this earth for many decades. I mean, those of us in the room, I don't think there's anyone over 100 yet. Then I'll have to use a century. But for for most of us, several decades, many decades. And to think for a moment that every day you wake up, you know there's going to be a morning, there's going to be a sunrise. You know that the air is of a particular composition that you can breathe. I mean, when we really pause for a moment and think about it, what is required for life to continue and the fact that it has been sustained not only in our decades of living, but in the millennia, the thousands and thousands and thousands of years of organisms being around. And if you talk about even before humanity, we talk about the millions of years. God is a creator who sustains. There is no chaos. And if you really even use these measurements from science to think about this, it should cause us to pause you know, and say, how is it uh, that the earth has been sustained all this time? How is it that we are able to use a scientific method to make measurements, to make assessments that are meaningful? It's because things are sustained. It's because there is a code in us, by the way, some people call what we are made of, we have a genetic code that enables some form of meaningful interpretation. And because, and because there is a system to it, and because it can be sustained, does it not allude to the plausibility of intelligent design? And for the people of God, it's a no-brainer. It says, everything that we see in creation, everything that we today see, is because 
of the God in whom we worship, who not only creates, but who also sustains. Now for us, on a personal level, even on a spiritual level, as we respond to these physical, biological realities of God the Creator, it should actually fuel us with a response of worship. I would like to encourage you, even as, as the week begins, find a time. Go to a park, go to a, a reserve, a forest reserve. Just spend two, three hours. Walk in the cool of the morning or in the evening if you, if you have to. And just pause. Hopefully in a place where there are no mosquitoes. But just pause and say, God, how great you are. How great you are that you have created me that I can reflect on the beauty of creation. How great you are that I can consider the different, different species of organisms and see that they're all distinctive, all have their own system, all have their own way, and they've been designed that way. It's not chaotic. This is the God in whom we worship, my friends. And if our spirituality has uh, unfortunately been just proposition after proposition without the context of creation, perhaps it's time for us to, in that sense, actually repent. Because the Psalms were not written only for worship within a building, as intentional as it is. It's good to be intentional in our worship, to come here as a rhythm of spirituality. But worship of God was not meant to be confined to just the building, my friends. I remember there was a time when I was leading a church and we went all the way to this uh, retreat centre that was close to Tanjung Malim, about one hour from here. There was a hot springs and rivers and we decided on that day for that Sunday service, we would do it outdoors, by the river. Just to worship God with His Word, but then to also worship God with our eyes as we looked around. This is the Creator God in whom we worship. Just some thoughts for us. The psalmist doesn't end here, however. He goes on to say, The Lord, in verse 10, brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the apostles. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of His heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom He has chosen as His heritage. The psalmist doesn't only entreat the people of God to worship God as a creator who sustains, but he also reminds the people of God that you are a nation under a God whose counsel supersedes that of all the other nations. Again, as Christians today in the 21st century, we may sometimes need to warm up you know, to, to this idea that God is not only God of my own individual life, not only my personal Lord and Saviour, God, the God of the Bible whom I worship, revealed in Jesus Christ, is the God whose counsel is also for the nations. And that is why every Sunday, my friends, we pray for leaders of nations. That is why, my friends, we pray for the well-being of in the international communities. Because we know there are people who seek to play the role of God in other people's lives, oppressing them for their own gain. But scripture here is very clear. These ancient passages show us even unchanging truths that are relevant for today. The psalmist says, The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation, not only the church, not only the people, but blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And that's why in our intercession, there we pray from whichever nation we come from that Yahweh will be God of that nation. That was a dangerous prayer. In some contexts, it could get you arrested. The, the early church faced that in a time when the Roman Empire would say, there is no Lord, there is no Son of God but Caesar. Uh, in case we forgot, yeah? The phrase Son of God was not exclusive to Christianity. It was first used by the Romans to refer to Caesar. Even the word Lord, kurios in Greek, was actually used for the Roman Empire. And the early church were forced to either suffer or recant. And don't say that Jesus is Lord, say Caesar is Lord. 
it is dangerous. There is a cost. And yet, if we really understand God, the God in whom we worship in Jesus, as not only creator of all that we are, physically, biologically, spiritually, but also God of how nations should be run. After all, don't nations always and their leaders always talk about justice, righteousness and flourishing, especially when you listen to their manifesto or when you listen to their political speeches? But what is it, what is it based on? And for the people of God, even for the church this morning, it has to be based on the precepts and the values, the unchanging righteousness of the God of the Bible. So, this is going to be a little bit uncomfortable for us Christians. Because when we proclaim that God is God of all, when we recognize that it goes beyond lip service, it means that we need to persuade others that only Yahweh, as revealed in Jesus Christ, only His counsel will stand forever. And when you look at the nation of Israel, actually, and you look at what was in store, what was in plan for them to flourish, that's why the psalmist can say in verse 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom He has chosen as His heritage. I find this to be a very significant claim because the people of Israel base their identity not on the numbers of the population, but they base their identity on who they worship. Has a nation ever done that since then? That their life, their nationhood, their virtues, their principles are based on God, not man-made laws, but God's laws as revealed to them. And I think for the church as well, this is a powerful impetus. Because we who claim that Jesus is Lord of all, we who claim that in Jesus there is fullness of life, we who claim that Jesus is the Prince of Peace in a time of conflict, Jesus who provides, who heals in a time of pain and need, all the more followers of Jesus need to go out into the world not to preach manifestos, but to demonstrate that. To demonstrate that life of abundance, of peace, of hope in the midst of chaos, oppression, and pain. Recently, I, I, just, uh, I was part of, uh, of an organization that was having a work and witness conference. That means these are all practitioners at the forefront of their industries, infrastructure, uh, retail, politics, all very committed Christians, and they came in to just share their testimony of how they are called to go into the public space to declare the greatness of God. But not just words, in a life of integrity, boldness to love, boldness to stand for what is right, fighting against corruption. The church is that nation of God, my friends. And the church is called to go out, to lift out the reign of God in love, in justice, in peace. What does that mean for all of us this morning? It means that in any sphere of your life, you could be retired, you could be in the thick of a corporate work, you could be in studies, it doesn't matter. Wherever God has placed you in your life, commit intentionally to living out the reign of God, not only as creator, but as Lord whose counsel supersedes that of the world. Be countercultural, not for the sake of it, but countercultural in the ways and the laws and the precepts of God. That's the implication of this hymn of praise, you know, with regard to God as the Lord whose counsel supersedes that of the nations. But finally, we see also this third aspect, whereby God is described as the ultimate saviour. We read in verses 13, the psalmist says, The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. 
and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, verse 18, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. The God whom Israel worshipped, the same God in Christ that the church worships and proclaims, is a God of salvation. What saves us today? What do you think keeps us secure in this day and age? Some people will tell me, you've got to get a really good insurance policy so that you can sleep well at night or life policy just in case if you pass away, your family be taken care of. Now, those things are not bad. I think you've heard me say this before in a previous sermon several years ago. But if that is your anchor of hope instead of Jesus, then you will worry about some of the clauses in your policy. <laughs> that you've got to pass away in a certain way. <laughs> there will be some limitations, some exceptions. But with Jesus, no clauses, no exceptions. The God of Israel, the God revealed to us in Jesus Christ is the ultimate saviour. And the psalmist here says that we do not put our hope in these things, these man-made structures. Yes, they're helpful for sure. For example, when he talks about the security of certain nations in ancient times, he talks about what? Great armies, strength of the infantry, talks about the horses. And Israel, even at the point of time when they had left Egypt, rescued from slavery, when they went into the promised land, God told them very specifically, you are not going to be like other nations. Under Yahweh, your hope is ultimately in me. And that means, actually, you know, he made some very bold claims. God told them, and God would be held by those words himself, you are not to buy horses for the infantry from Egypt. And you're thinking, God, that's not very prudent, right? If we are going to preserve our nation, we should invest in all the weapons that we can. We should have our people trained in the military. It's really interesting, you know, if you really go through the Old Testament, it's not just understanding faith in God in the context of your own personal private life so that you feel good and you feel a sense of self-actualization. <laughs> you know, it, in, in the Old Testament, life with God to flourish was in the context of relations with other nations politically, was in the context of living out righteousness within to ensure that no one was treated in a way that dehumanized them. Those who were immigrants, those who were Aliens, as they call it in, in, in Old Testament theology, were to be treated with respect. Widows and children were to be treated well, taken care of. Those without status would not fall through the cracks. If you really look at the Old Testament blueprint for the kingdom of God, you'd be thinking, hey, this is not just meant for the family. This is meant for nations. And that's why all the more the Christian voice as we commit to the word of God in its entirety, the cross as well as the kingdom, we cannot help but go into the world. We are not to be smug about it, not to be obnoxious or arrogant about it, but we also cannot forget uh, that we have a mission, not only to enjoy the blessings of God, a peace that surpasses understanding, not only that, yes, it includes that, but it's so that it will overflow. It will overflow to our neighbours, to our family members, to our society. The psalmist here says, for a nation under God, we recognize that Savior, that Deliverer, can only be the Lord. And this is so important for the way churches present their witness outside. I don't just mean collectively, but even individually as you go out. When people tell you it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, you need to look after number one, you cannot be too kind lest people take advantage of you. You have to think the worst of everyone. Now, I'm not saying you be naive. I'm not saying you be someone who is not informed. But I'm saying that your security really does not rest in these mechanisms of the world. It rests in the Creator who sustains. 
in rest in the Lord whose counsel supersedes all nations. It rests in the ultimate Savior. Who, by the way, in this paragraph, doesn't only describe God as Savior of our soul, but Savior from physical famine. If you look at the end there, it says, in verses 18 and 19, it says, Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him, on those who hope in His steadfast love, that He may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. God is both Lord and Savior of both the spiritual realm and the realm that we live in, in the physical. If we put all these together, I don't know, if we just pause a moment, the fact that the God we, in whom we worship, the Creator who sustains everything that we see today for millions of years, the God whose counsel supersedes that of all nations, even in the midst of political upheaval, the Saviour, who is not defined by all of this military strength, the Saviour who is defined by His self-sustaining self as Saviour in both the spiritual and the physical realm. You cannot help but shout for joy. Why? Because you are secure. We are secure. I am secure. You know, in Jesus Christ, He fulfills all of this in His fullest sense. Let's not forget, Jesus wasn't just the Savior, as we have just read here as well. God is not the Savior, but in Jesus Christ, He ushered in the kingdom of God on earth. In Jesus Christ, we worship a Savior who not only brings about His kingdom on earth, but who is Himself, the very Creator. John chapter 1 says that about Jesus as the Word, the Word who became flesh, through whom all things were made. That is the audacious claim of Christianity that this man, Jesus, is also fully divine. And that's why it causes a very big reaction when we say that. If you say Jesus is a, okay, a very nice, gentle saviour, walks with the poor, that's good enough. No, he's more than that. If you say Jesus was a very good teacher, okay, it's good enough. No, he's more than that. If you say Jesus is a miracle worker, you say, well, I'm not too sure if that really did exist, but it helped people, then you say that's good enough. No. Christian proclamation of Jesus is actually even echoed here in Psalm 33. John says that he is the creator. In the Gospels, Jesus is pronounced as Lord of all. We see that in the epistles as well. For example, in Philippians, let me just read that section to you. In Philippians chapter 2, it says here, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. We see, isn't it, that Jesus actually is the culmination of all that we hear and read of in Psalm 33. And that's why it's interesting that as the psalm ends with this prayer, in light of these reflections, this threefold reflection whereby God is a sustaining creator, God is the Lord in whom his counsel supersedes that of the other nations, God is the ultimate saviour in Christ. We see that all fulfilled, isn't it? And now we see at the end of this psalm, there is a posture of worship. It says in verse 20, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Our heart is glad in Him. Because, why? What's the reason why we can be glad? Because we trust in His holy name. And He ends with this prayer of aspiration. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. And in Jesus Christ, this prayer continues to be so relevant. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Because in Christ, we not only have the presence of God, we have the hope of God in the new heaven and the earth to come. We say this in our creeds, isn't it? We believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life of 
the world to come. And so this psalm is not only ancient wisdom, it becomes a projection of our aspiration for the culmination of God's promises in Jesus. And I just want to end with this note of encouragement for all of us. If we have been worried, if we have forgotten who God is, I want to encourage you to not only be informed in your mind, but to pray for the Holy Spirit to let you appreciate this is the God in whom you worship. Not only a personal and relational God, but a great God. A great God in all of existence, in both realms. A great God who sustains. A great God of wisdom. A great God who saves. You may ask yourself, what should I do with this reflection? I've alluded to it just now. Go into all the world. Go into every public space that you have been placed by the Lord and demonstrate this God in whom we preach in your life. A life of integrity, a life of love, a life of wisdom. In Jesus Christ, let us pray. Father, for all that has been said, for all musings and applications, we yield to you. We thank you, O oh God, that as we walk with you, we know that you hold our hand as Creator, as Lord, as Saviour. We thank you for Jesus because he is the culmination of all of these aspects. We thank you, O oh God, in him, we not only worship Him as a Saviour of our souls, but we worship Him as a Creator. In Jesus, You, O oh Lord Jesus, we worship You not only as a Saviour of our souls, but as the Lord of nations. And in You, lest we forget, we worship You, Jesus, as a Saviour who will make all things new. Be with us, O oh God, as we go back into the marketplace, as we go back to our families, that we go forth in your strength, in your spirit, with this conviction. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.